Hello everyone, this is Bob Renner with uh, Community Coronavirus Update number 44. The themes today will be how the 4-H Green Books and Accrual Accounting can help you understand COVID and avoiding the herd. So uh, I gave a talk with the Society of American Military Engineers a, a couple weeks ago, and I, I like their quote of the day they used, and that the more you know, the less you fear. And so there's a lot of fear and anxiety, and I think it, part of the uh, what's causing people's mental health issues is just the uncertainty, misinformation, everything out there. So part of the intent of these is these YouTube videos is to help you understand it better, to hopefully allay some of your fears, reduce the anxiety. Uh, you know, this is an astronaut saying this. Well, he was you know flying on a tin can that could explode any moment. Uh, yeah, you got to know how it all works and hopefully that even though you're in a potentially dangerous situation by understanding you do reduce your fear. Uh, so I'll use a couple analogies. It's good to learn. This is a, uh, I'll use the 4-H green, but uh, this is me when I was back in Little Bobby Rounder when I was at the Cheyenne County Fair. Uh, looking through these 4-H green books, they're very data-driven, interestingly. Uh, I actually pulled out my four, old 4-H green book, and uh, there's things like cost of gain, rate of gain, how, how much the cow weighed when you started. Uh, really, it's a very good plan, uh, and it, frankly, uh, the, uh, the outline of a 4-H green book would fit with a business plan or a grant application. Uh, it's actually pretty data-driven. Uh, and one of our challenges, of course, is we don't have a very good scale with coronavirus but the data it makes a lot of sense and I really like the old 4-H pledge you know you're using your head for clear thinking so you want to understand this stuff you want to understand the numbers but it's also about your heart and in our hands we need to do our, our hard work to help others and it's about our health for better living the club and communities and so I really like the 4-H concept uh, and I think it has a little bit to say with some wisdom about today in the coronavirus so so what's the head part of it how do you understand the numbers and unfortunately what we're seeing is that the numbers are growing pretty much uh, unchecked throughout the middle of the country in rural America. Uh, so it, things unfortunately just seem to keep get, getting worse. Um, if you look at Nebraska, it's pretty much spread all across Nebraska now with rates of spread very high. Um, the big problem uh, is, is that I'm worried about lately is, is will we exceed our hospital capacity in the near future. Last week we talked about how we, uh, you know, our prior record had been 232 hospitalizations. Last week we were at 271. Yesterday we were at 315. And what frustrates me is that you can predict some of this stuff ahead of time, but we do not seem to be doing this. Another analogy I want to use is accrual counting versus cash basis counting. Yeah, most of us in our daily lives, we use cash basis. Uh, is there enough money in my checking account that I can pay my bills tomorrow? But most companies, when they get more sophisticated, move from a cash basis to accrual because it's a better way to project your expenses, your revenue. Uh, almost all publicly traded, traded companies move to, to a, uh, the accrual counting method. It's a little more sophisticated. You have to watch your cash flow, but it's a better way to manage for the future and anticipate what's going to happen in the future. And we need to be doing this for coronavirus, but it frustrates me that uh, at least uh, it seems to be managed by amateurs who don't even know how to predict basic things like this, just like a, they, they've not switched from cash basis to accrual counting. So by predicting the future, we got to look at what our hospitalization is going to be, not whether are they right now. And so you might have seen our link in the hospitals to say they have no capacity issues right now. And if you look at the state website, they say, well, we've got 24% available. But both CHI and Bryan Health say that nursing staff is the biggest limitation, it's not this number. So it is nice that there's a space and potentially a ventilator, but you got to have a nurse to run that thing. And how do you reconcile that? with UNMC people uh, having their news report last week saying, you know, wait, uh, we're going to exceed hospital capacity. Well, they have to always look at all public health as somewhat local. Uh, Lincoln's rates are holding somewhat steady, so our hospital capacity is not doing too bad here in Lincoln. Uh, but Douglas County, where UNMC is, their rates are growing dramatically. And so UNMC is looking at its numbers, and their numbers are not looking good. Ours are sort of hovering there. We want them to go down, hopefully, in the next few weeks. But U Douglas County is looking at a different picture. On top of that, they have to be looking at the entire state, the referral center. Uh, and so if you look at hospitalization rates, one of my frustrations is we're not projecting forward. We're only looking at today. Well, if you look at uh, where we were, you know, our peak hospital, prior peak hospitalization happened May 27th based on numbers from May 8th. We should look at our numbers uh, today and project forward where they're going to go based on that. If we do that, our projected hospitalizations the next couple of weeks are 530 way beyond the 315 and then even Lincoln may have to start taking some of that overflow and that's what the UNMC people are worried about when they look at their they're like Wayne Gretzky and they're not just looking at where the puck is they're looking where the puck's going to be and it does not look like it's going to be where you want it uh, rural is even worse and so that's what they're looking at they want to be able to be there are state uh, our state university system and they want to be able to serve all of Nebraska if needed well state's numbers are actually even worse than Douglas County if you look at the the, the uh, the state without Omaha and Lincoln, they're at 39 per 100,000 and rising. And so what's going to happen 
is all those uh, could be coming our way. Uh, unfortunately, it seems that a lot of the uh, country uh, in the middle seems to be going for herd. They think that herd immunity is the way to go, but they have not run the numbers. They don't realize how many fatalities that is going to be. Uh, we've already had 200,000 plus fatalities, and uh, we're only about maybe a fifth of the way herd immunity for most ex experts. So we're talking about adding another 800,000 to a million dead people if we're going to roll straight for herd immunity. Uh, and so uh, I think what's happening is that the UMC is looking and saying, well, geez, we, uh, South Dakota, North Dakota, Iowa, their numbers are worse than ours. Those hospitals are filling up. As, the, as the people start needing hospitalizations and overwhelm their hospital capacity, are we going to be able to accept these people in Omaha and Lincoln going forward? And that's what they're really looking for. Um, so unfortunately, it looks like there's a good chunk of the, the state that wants to go for herd immunity, uh, but that doesn't mean all of us have to. I suspect there's 30% of the people out there who just think this is either a hoax, that it's all overblown, don't really understand the numbers, uh, but I think most people do understand. And so how can you, uh, if you want to stay of, uh, uh, safe, avoid the herd uh, and stay sane? Well, one thing that we have to do is maintain our safe common spaces that everybody has to go to. If the people want to go for herd, want to do it for themselves, as long as they don't make us go with them. So as long as we can go to the grocery store, safely and, and, and everybody's masked, I'm okay with a grocery store. As a school board member, I have to think about keeping the schools safe for everybody. There are people who uh, want us to just take away all the restrictions, uh, but they can't. We have to make the decisions for all kids, not just some kids and not just your kids. So we have to think of the whole uh, work. Well, hopefully I, there's not much, you know, that's something you have to work out yourself. Hopefully you can, you're in a work environment where you can stay safe and wear a mask. Uh, but through all this, we have to avoid uh, social isolation so we can stay sane. So the, the, one of the big questions is, is COVID spreading in schools? Uh, right now, we have no evidence of within school spread. However, we don't really have a lot of direct testing to back that up at this point. Uh, it is possible it's spreading undetected uh, to parents without our knowledge because we're not doing any surveillance testing. Uh, other countries are doing surveillance testing. Uh, they've been doing it for uh, quite a while now, like Germany and China. Uh, so I wish we could do that, but unfortunately it's hard to do without any state cooperation because they run the testing capacity and they have the money. Uh, they are doing it with universities, but they're not doing it through K through 12. So hopefully we'll get those answers. Uh, hopefully someone across the country will do some surveillance testing of schools to prove that for us so we know one way or the other it is this safe. Um, there's an article in the Atlantic, which I think is, is kind of helpful, but a little misleading. It says schools aren't super spreaders. I would say schools aren't super spreaders for the last month or two. We do know that they were super spreaders back before there were mask ordinances. Uh, and so there were numerous cases in Israel, for example, was the first place that started having massive school outbreaks, but that's because they weren't wearing masks. I think we do know that if most kids are wearing masks, then schools aren't super spreaders. Uh, unfortunately, though, that, that this, uh, thought was based when our spread, rate of spread was down in this area. Is that, are we still going to not be super spreaders of schools when our rates are up in this area? And that's the question we don't know right now. So uh, the newer concern is that there is some change in the thinking. There is likely some aerosol spread in addition to droplet spread. If it was only droplet spread, I would say, yeah, we can bring all the kids back to school uh, as long as they're wearing masks, even if we can't maintain distancing. Uh, but with some aerosol spread, what we don't know now is how much aerosol spread. And our current school plans, they were based back when we thought, you know, community rates of spread would be five per 100,000. Now that we're over 25 per 100,000, we have a five to six fold increase of where we were. Is that enough to increase across that aerosol spread uh, threshold? Uh, and Lincoln, our decision was, do we do we bring all the, kid, all the kids back in high school, thus doubling our high school pass capacity? Well, that would make this times two. Now you have a 10 to 12 fold increase. Would that still be safe? Uh, the answer is actually, we just don't know. What is the threshold for aerosol spread? We don't know what that is. Uh, there are some models out there, but I don't think they've actually been tried out in real life yet. Uh, the real answer, honestly, would be if we're going to bring the kids back like this, I think we need to have a, uh, some surveillance testing in place to make sure that we can do this safely, or we have to get our rates back down. Either one, I think, would put us to the point where I personally would be okay uh, with bringing all the kids back to high school. So avoiding the, the herd and staying sane. Uh, the other part, of course, is you have to avoid social isolation. How do you maintain your sanity through all this? Um, the, one of the uh, good article I thought was this one uh, from the also from the Atlantic, how to tell if socializing indoors is safe. Um, the problem we have is that we know that outdoors is about 20 times lower risk than indoors. Uh, so when is it okay to start bringing people indoors and hanging out with the birthday party and things like that? We know that those are super spreader events. Uh, and the question is the experts actually don't agree on this. Uh, for example, they asked in this article, Caitlin Rivers, who's at Johns Hopkins, uh, her threshold for when she might think this might be okay is into five to 10 
per thousand range. Uh, Tom Sai from Harvard, he's saying 25 per hundred thousand. Uh, and so it's kind of hard. I mean, honestly, we literally don't know. We've, we're still learning more things, and so the thresholds that the experts don't agree yet. Uh, that is why if you go to the healthynebraska.org website, we have two different thresholds. One is the all eight uh, threshold that UNMC and Ali Khan have been using. Uh, those five, this is actually the five and ten threshold that, that Caitlin Rivers is using. So, so the five is red and blue is way too high according to, to both uh, Caitlin Rivers and Ali Khan. Or if you want to be able to use a little more lax standards of Harvard, you can click on this way. And we'll put it both ways uh, because, I, to be honest with you, I don't know which is the right one. Uh, you can decide yourself. Uh, and so one of the things they talk about that article is you need to look local. And they say that a lot of places it's hard to know. Well, the reason we put this tablet tablet website up there is you can click on your own county, look where you are, and decide whether it's safe for you. And so use those thresholds as best you can. Um, we do know that a lot of our spread is now coming more and more from small household gatherings. It's not just, uh, yes, there were a lot of super spread events even locally. So in here in Lincoln, it was the Eagles Club dance a few weeks back, the fraternity parties down at the university. Those were super spreader events. But we're now seeing that most spread is now at small social gatherings. It's things like the video game of Thom in the basement where, all the, where your, the kid and his buddies come over. It's cheerleaders in the deck doing their hair, not distancing. It's guys having a beer after a golf scramble. It's the multiple family birthday parties. This seems to be the major issue we're having right now. Uh, the other word I have is I've, uh, some physicians I know have been saying that many of the older people who are getting sick and hospitalized didn't contact track the virus from their own high-risk behavior. They got it from a younger relative. And so if you're going to engage in this, this behavior, you need to be very careful of not spreading it to your, to your mom or your dad, your uncle, your grandma, because you do not want to be responsible for making your grandparents sick, hospitalized, or dead. Uh, you as a young person are probably have a very good chance, but you have to realize that you have the responsibility to those around you. Uh, and this is the big worry that I have is that people are going to do this, but then spread it to their older relatives. Uh, another thing I want to talk about, I did have a one typo in last uh, week's uh, thing, uh, episode about isolation time. People still are very confused by that. It should have said October 11, not, not October 10. Day 10 of isolation is based on day 0 to day 10. Uh, the other thing that was that was uh, confusing to some people is your, your isolation time, if you have coronavirus, it's either, if you're asymptomatic, it's when your test is positive. But if you're symptomatic, let's say your test came back this day, it's when your symptoms started here. So we know that about 10 days is, is the course. So if you have no symptoms uh, and you're at the end of that 10 days, uh, you are safe to go. You do not need to get retested again. Uh, there's not been any cases that I'm aware of or that the literature shows where people are infectious after that 10th day uh, if they have no symptoms anymore. Now, it's different if you still have symptoms. Uh, and if you've gathered, of course, this is complicated. That's why you should respond and talk to the contact tracers. They do this day in day out and talk to people. I hear a lot of confusion. Uh, also, if you're having symptoms, you should have contact your doctor to make sure that they also know what's going on because there will always be exceptions to this and so this is not something they can put into central central out, out, simple algorithm that's why we have contact tracers and that's why we have physicians uh, and lastly it still goes back to the common things the japanese without doing lockdowns and draconian measures were able to get their uh, uh, their pandemic under control and are one of the best in country with these two simple things wear a mask avoid closed crowded spaces and close contact stacing that was what worked uh, they're putting, uh, again, the UNMC uh, guidance they pushed out recently is there is some change in thinking. I think people are a little overdoing it with some of the disinfecting. Essentially, basically, just disinfect frequently touch services. You don't have to clean everything every day. Uh, we do not think that the main thing uh, is contacts. Uh, so washing your hands and good hygiene and just common sense cleaning is probably enough. Uh, but we knew, know that at least six, but probably more is preferred because of the potential of airborne spread. And everybody should be wearing a mask around others, uh, indoors especially, uh, or outdoors if you can't maintain that six feet distance. Lastly, maintain your sanity. So, social distancing does not mean social isolation. And so it should have been physical distancing. So get out and there are safe things to do. So like I say, I don't wear a mask when I'm outside and I can maintain my six feet difference. This is me with my father-in-law and my dad. Uh, we go out to events like this. If it's outdoors, this is a perfectly safe, this is a safe situation. I don't think you need a mask. Uh, for travel, road trips, I think are great. Make sure you find places to eat outside. Here's the hub. Uh, uh, last weekend where we went after a nice bike ride. Uh, the challenge for us is going to become this winter. Uh, how do we stay warm and be outside? Well, you know, we bought the propane heater because we're going to still keep getting together on the patio, socializing regularly. So find ways to get out of the house, 
do it safely, uh, road trips, eating outside, and figuring out ways to be warm. So we may, we may have to have some talks later about uh, how, to, how to dress warm, kind of like the Norwegians saying, there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad clothing. Uh, maybe we just need to dress warmer and have fire pits and uh, things like this. So hopefully this helps uh, helpful you, that knowledge will hopefully delay some of your fears. Uh, we'll, I'll try to keep doing these every week, and the old episodes are at healthylincoln.org and, of course, the disclaimer.